Um, th we have a group of summer students who work with us every year, uh, and uh, it's great to have a large group in the summer. The four scientists who are represented their work here, uh, myself, uh, Nicola, right here, uh, Charlie, and uh, Rajesh. Uh, where did Rajesh go? Oh, there he is. I guess we're all standing in the back. Uh, and it's a fairly large collaborative project with folks at uh, other universities and uh, um, other laboratories. But uh, we're going to talk today about sort of what's happening in this space where we have uh, autonomous and uh, edge computing uh, that is linking to high performance computing. So the interplay between those two pieces. So uh, I work at Argonne National Lab. It's one of these big science laboratories in the United States. Uh, we do open research uh, and almost everything is, is sort of out there. This is our big uh, uh, electron uh, uh, ring, which we use to make uh, coherent x-rays for uh, imaging. And our building, which has the supercomputers off the screen here, because uh, it's not as interesting as this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, But we do normally at Argonne our our uh, big presence in Exascale is with both software and uh, applications and fielding very large computers. So we have a large uh, supercomputer that we expect to be the first Exascale computer that will be delivered in 2021. So this project, however, starts in a farm field. Uh, and it starts, uh, this is a, one of those community farm fields where uh, um, it's sort of in an urban space, but they're growing organic vegetables and you buy a share of the vegetables. Uh, uh, and there was a scientist in our um, environmental science group who had a hypothesis. That hypothesis was that uh, by using a hyperspectral camera, uh, which measures many, many bands of visible light, that you could look at plants and actually determine when they're doing photosynthesis and when they're not. So uh, the color would change very, very slightly, but sufficiently that you could determine photosynthesis from not. So this is an interesting problem. Again, it's her problem. She's an environmental scientist. Uh, and they came to us and said, you know, we'd like some help. And you know, we soon realized that what they really needed was their hyperspectral camera only ran on Windows and uh, they wanted uh, someone to help them get it to Linux. It's not really a computer science problem, uh, but we did find out after looking at their work that there's a very interesting uh, problem with respect to data. So a hyperspectral camera measures hundreds of bands. All of these bands uh, summed up with respect to the pixels. Uh, it turns out that each image is about five gigabytes. Now you can't shave, peg, compress this. That removes the signal. So you really need all of that data. And if you wanted to put several of these out in farm fields and you wanted to sample every few minutes, suddenly you have a problem where you have a terabyte of data every day. So now we have a good computer science problem, right? Which is, okay, I need to figure out a way to process at the edge that data because there's no way I can get that data efficiently across uh, to a supercomputer. I just have, I can't, it's just gonna be too much data, especially if I have a bunch of distributed nodes. So as we looked at this, we realized there are other projects also in this space. So this is a project called IceCube. Uh, uh, Ron Livney, who is a uh, HPC guy that you might know from Condor and other things. Uh, um, they are involved in this project. This is a facility uh, at Antarctica. There are uh, thousands of, of probes under the ground that are looking for neutrinos. And uh, if you look at the data path here, you have these 5,000 optical sensors looking for neutrinos, and it creates a terabyte of day of data. You don't have a terabyte of day of data through the satellite link from Antarctica, so you need to actually run an edge computation right there. Now, of course, you don't have a problem cooling your equipment. Uh, you have a problem heating it up. Uh, you can't let it run at room temperature or it wouldn't run. Uh, so, uh, so we have this problem again where you have too much data here and you really need to run parallel computation out at the site. So it brings on this concept of edge computing where we, we want to be not in the center, not in the, in the city, 
but out here and where the data is being collected, I'm going to start running algorithms and start running computation on it. Now, this is, is nothing new. Uh, people have been doing this for a while, but now we have a breakthrough when it comes to machine learning. So now we have ways to actually do really interesting inference and uh, analysis of the data right there at the edge as the data comes in. So we have this new world, this new picture, which has a variety of high performance definition uh, bandwidth sensors and actuators. And then we need to do machine learning, we need to do computation on this. This is a device NVIDIA makes, a small you know, handheld uh, computer. I wouldn't call it a supercomputer, but it's pretty powerful, 256 Pascal cores. Uh, it's running at about 15, 20 watts. Um, and you can do a, an amazing amount of computation out at the sensor, at the edge. And so then what happens is you're not sending all the data home, but some sort of reduced, some semantic understanding of that data, what it means. So we have this new loop that happens in computing now where training data goes to the supercomputer, to the cloud, and inference models go out to the edge where then the sensors can use that inference to process data and then it sends back and we keep improving this over time. So the concept is that we want to improve the training, which improves the edge, which improves the training, and we keep going back and forth. So when should we use edge computing? Um, really there are four, there's also a fifth, but really there are four key pieces. So the first I already mentioned is when uh, you have more data than bandwidth. That's pretty obvious, right? So you can't possibly send all the data back. You have an edge problem. The second is when you have a latency constraint. So if you have a self-driving car, you obviously, no matter how much bandwidth you have, you would not want the picture of a stop sign to go to California, be processed, and come back to you before you decide, you know, your car decides to apply the brakes, right? So we have the same problem with many edge devices is that we have a latency issue that we really have to be able to respond in some number of milliseconds or, or one or two seconds. We also have privacy and security issues. So it's very common for cities and other places to say, I want to analyze scene information, but I would love for you to throw that away and actually not send any of it back uh, to the cloud. Right? I just want to know that I'm not sending most of the frames back, maybe some training data early on or occasional debugging data, but I'm not sending every frame, I just can't. And finally, we have a very interesting resilience uh, uh, question, which is that whenever we have a centralized service, we also have a centralized, as some people would say, a, a centralized point of success or you know, failure, right? And so that means I would love to have an infrastructure where if you cut the city in half with a backhoe because you've you know, broken a fiber optic cable, that both sides of the city or both sides of your distributed infrastructure continue to work. So these four pieces sort of define this new world of edge computing. And we fit that into this continuum now of computing where you know, almost all of my career was spent designing software and hardware infrastructure for supercomputers. And there's an interesting observation here where these devices, you have one or two of them, but they have 10 to the ninth uh, you know, cores, right? On this end, these devices are simple, handful of cores, but you have 10 to the ninth of them, right? So you have the same sort of scale across these uh, devices, uh, but you have a different programming style over here, all the way down to the edge. And so a really great computer science question is what's the programming model and the programming discipline and structure where I can compose algorithms that can live and be pushed back and forth from training and uh, computation at the edge to large massive uh, uh, work and simulation in the cloud. So now, Early on, we realized that if we wanted to do this, put hyperspectral cameras, put devices out there, and put really cool new edge computation out there, we have a problem. And that is that uh, it, there's a design contradiction, which is that 
experimental machine learning and GPU stuff fails all the time, and you're deploying them remotely. Okay, so now I can't send a grad student up a pole to hit the reset button uh, uh, more than once a year. Okay, uh, it's just it's a bad thing, right? So I really have to now solve this problem where I want to put really crazy new machine learning hardware out places, but I need a way to manage it remotely. So this kind of computer, which gives you these kind of uh, uh, you know uh, kernel dumps, has to be handled. So we decided that we would learn from our HPC space. So you know we do supercomputers like you guys, and we would build a mini rack controller. So a rack controller normally allows you to get remote console, allows you to power on and off devices. So we built a, a small pocket-sized version of one of those, and it's old school. <laughs> So these are relays, you know, old-fashioned relays. Why? Because relays work. <laughs> and you can actually physically disconnect a sensor or a computer from your power supply, completely disconnect it, right? And so this allows us a way to manage remotely really experimental devices, even you know, reinstall the operating system from scratch. So we built this platform, we call it Waggle, uh, and it supports parallel computation out on the edge, and we can put any kind of interesting machine learning hardware. It's open source. Uh, we have many interfaces for integrating sensors, everything from analog to uh, uh, Ethernet, I squared C, all of that. And uh, we finally, after developing some prototypes, have a local electronics company that makes the, the rack controller. You know, you know, pocket rack controller. That's not the key part of the research, but it certainly makes managing, you know, hundreds of distributed, uh, uh, unusual edge computers uh, possible. So now, step back a minute. Say, all right, so I have, I can deploy machine learning hardware, all this cool new hardware that vendors are are building. I have a way to control it, and I have a bunch of sensors, and I can now write code for the city. What would that code look like? Right? What does it mean to have a smart city or a smart infrastructure? What kinds of programs might you run? So we're going to run through a bunch of examples, but um, the real question I'll, I'll sort of pose is we're only limited by our imagination. So uh, there are many things that people come up with, and we'll talk about near the end of the presentation, of what kinds of applications you might run in a smart edge infrastructure that's connected to a supercomputer. So the first application and the biggest of these is the Array of Things project. So this is led by Charlie Catlett, and the Array of Things project adopted this platform that I just described, and already has 100 nodes up in the city of Chicago. And uh, uh, over here are you know, real early electricians, uh, you know, who are grabbing that device, are going to go up in a bucket truck, uh, they drill a hole in uh, one of these uh, traffic signal poles, they feed the wire through, install a 10 amp circuit, and strap our node onto the pole. Uh, we have a bunch of other cities, uh, and we just were visiting, uh, I was just visiting Bruce, uh, uh, Melbourne, and Melbourne would like to uh, try deploying six nodes throughout the city. Uh, and they have a camera that faces up, a camera that faces down, and a microphone for the edge processing stuff that we're going to talk about in a moment. So, in addition to air quality man you know, uh, measurements, and we have an EPA which, which measures air quality in cities as an example, but there are very few sites. You know, there are only a handful of EPA sites. What we want is really dense measurement. And uh, even if it's a little bit less accurate or precise, we can make up for the science by having a dense network, hundreds of nodes. But we also want to understand activity and uh, what's happening in the city. So this is what's in the, this box here is called the Stevenson Shield. It's, it's uh, got these louvers uh, uh, where air can come in and we measure the standard sorts of things. PM 2.5 with a particulates in the air, you know, sound, temperature, humidity, pressure. But then, the part that's from a computer science perspective interesting, this is just deploying sensors. It's good, but easy. This is the hard part. What kind of parallel code can we run out there in this box? 
So if we look inside one of these boxes, we have the brain part right here. This is the, the part for measuring the environmentals. And we have these three components. We have a single board computer that is standalone that just manages everything. And then we have an edge processing computer. And this is separate. So in reality, I could give you root on this node and let you write whatever cool code you want that runs at the edge and try your new machine learning algorithms. And it only talks over ethernet to this device, which then has connectivity. So I can reboot you, I could decide not to carry your data. So it really gives us a way to run essentially a user app at the edge. And then here's our, our rack controller, as I mentioned. So uh, this is what it looks like uh, to build one uh, in time lapse here. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, this is a, you know, we built this using a prototyping uh, shop. So it is not designed for mass market. It can't be something that you make easily, but it requires a lot of hand uh, construction. And here is the uh, power cable ready to go. Uh, it screws in the bottom here, and there's two little components here that uh, attach to the pole with the stainless steel strap. And this is very easy. This was designed by the electricians, this part, because that's how they put up, you know, holiday wreaths or, or lights or anything else. They just put something up there. They have this sort of machine that puts a stainless steel strap through and crimps it and so it's very easy to install. So we're looking at a variety of impacts and in, in science with respect to the lake and with respect to the city, uh, understanding the environment, understanding transportation safety, uh, bus transportation, and we already have, even with just a hundred nodes, we have about 80 percent of the population within two kilometers of a node. So that's really quite remarkable. And as we keep adding sensors, we'll get all the way up to about 95% of the population, or even 75% within a kilometer. So now let's talk about some of the edge computation. Let's dive in. So this is a project uh, that was done by a student from Purdue, and they're looking at understanding pedestrian you know, a flow and a, you know, movement. Now, this is important for safety reasons, because you want to understand the movement of cars and pedestrians, and when pedestrians have to jump back and get out of the way because cars are, are doing something uh, dangerous, or when intersections are designed poorly and there are a lot of close calls. Uh, right now, the only anal analytics cities have is when someone's injured, right? Then they call. So there's no way to know ahead of time, is this a dangerous intersection until someone actually gets injured? And usually it takes several people before anything happens, right? So, so understanding an analysis of what's happening from a machine learning perspective could be very powerful. This is a picture from uh, Lakeshore Drive in Chicago, and it's uh, last winter, so it's snowy. This is snow out here. And uh, we're running a standard, uh, you know, CNN here, uh, looking and identifying objects. Now, if you just looked at this picture, you might say, whoa, okay, there is a safety problem, right? We have two pedestrians in the middle of this sea of cars, right? That can't be good. Uh, now, if we look at this picture over here, and you see that they're wearing yellow, okay, then you know they're either in Paris protesting or, <laughs> or uh, they're policemen, right? Um, so, you know, because there's only two, I think we can assume they're, they're policemen, right? So this is where the algorithms have to be smart, right? Where we have to imagine creating machine learning algorithms that could even determine, are they officials or not? Are they in the middle of traffic? Is this a dangerous situation? So this kind of research uh, is something that we want to enable. We have two new projects we've only just started that are, again, transportation related. Uh, one is understanding the impact of what we in the US refer to as at grade railroad crossings. So this is when the road doesn't go below or over the train, but you have to stop. So the city has about $2 billion to spend to improve these. It has to know where. So how would you determine where? Where you have to do some analysis where again, you can analyze the scene information and understand how many ambulances get stuck behind trains, right? In this particular area, that might be more important than just delaying people, right? Maybe it's a thoroughfare near a, a hospital, right? Um, uh, how many dangerous uh, interactions are there? 
Uh, we also have one with O'Hare International Airport where they're looking to understand flow because of the change in the airport, what will happen in the future with respect to this expansion that's happening at the airport. Another important one is water and flooding. And uh, uh, Chicago has a storm system, storm water system, uh, that people refer to as a combined system. Uh, and uh, you should all be asking combined with what? <laughs> um, so unfortunately, uh, it's combined with the sewer, right? Uh, which means that when the system is overloaded and floods, that's not water in your basement, okay? Uh, and as a homeowner, that's happened twice to me. <laughs> so, so it's something that the city would like to fix. If you look at a map of, of you know, problems in the city, you can see it's a pretty ubiquitous problem. And it's because Chicago is a very old city and the infrastructure below the city is hundreds of years old, right? Um, so we've been working on doing machine learning to automatically detect surface water, being able to classify that. And if you look at this picture, we have a camera out at a park now. And I realize there are raindrops on the camera, but we can see on the grass here, there, there's already water forming. And this is exactly the kind of thing we want to be able to pull out using machine learning to understand and build a hydrological model where we are not sending all the images and all of this data back, but we're just analyzing what portion of the frame, if I looked at a camera image, can I tell what part of the, of the frame is covered by water and how rapidly is that water moving? Uh, with Australia here, we had someone from CSIRO come visit Argonne for six weeks. Uh, there's a project at uh, CSIRO to do fire and flood modeling, and they would like to build and put some of these nodes uh, out so that they can analyze what's happening and improve their models. Uh, we have several other projects that are ecosystem related. Uh, uh, students actually looking at classifying different plants automatically telling one kind of plant from another so that you can analyze green roofs and understand which plants are growing faster than others under what conditions, what should be planted up there. Uh, students are adding new kinds of sensors uh, to these devices. Um, this one is a particular uh, fun one is, uh, you know, when we first built the device and designed the device, um, we had a camera that we pointed up. And, uh, and someone asked me once, well, you know, why'd you do that? And I said, well, honestly, because it was cheap. Um, you know, it's only a hundred bucks to put a, a camera and we might as well see what's happening up. And I figured climate scientists would be interested in this, cloud cover. Um, but after putting the camera facing up, we had somebody who came and said, well, um, there a visiting scholar from uh, the Air Force said, I would love to be able to write some machine learning code that could determine what's a bird, what's a drone, and what's a fixed-wing aircraft. So he took this as a challenge, and uh, this is a fixed-wing craft, this is a flock of birds, and over here's a drone, and you're really using, combining two machine learning techniques. So one is standard classification, right? You look at something and you look at its silhouette and you've, you've done the standard sort of image classification. However, the second is the path or the track with which an object moves. And it turns out that fixed wing craft and drone and bird have different tracks. And when you combine that information with silhouette information, you can get pretty good at picking out drones. Um, so this is Soldier Field, uh, which is where the Bears play American football uh, here. And so we have six nodes that we have put up around the stadium because they're very interested in people flying drones near the stadium, which has you know many people. I think they're actually most interested because they don't want copyright infringement of getting the game, uh, you know, taking pictures. But there's also, of course, is a security concern. Well, they did shoot it down. Uh, well, <laughs> so um, they, uh, we have talked to folks about what what they do, and it's interesting. You learn these new terms like, well, we would like a way to to remove the drone that has um, uh, low regret. <laughs> and, and, and what that means, of course, is that if you, you know, if, if you do uh, 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 bring one down, it doesn't really harm anything and no one cares, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, you can't use anything that has high regret, apparently. Um, 
So we also have a project with uh, our power company. Uh, it's the nation's largest power company, Exelon. They own a bunch of small power companies. And the idea here is, so in the previous pictures, the array of things box is that attractive looking thing that goes on in cities. It was designed by the School of the Art Institute. Uh, we refer to this as the ugly box. Uh, this is just a standard plastic box where we put all the components in so we can uh, you know, hack on it and change things. And on the other side of that dotted line is a sensor that measures uh, power grid very, very precisely. It has a GPS and it can tell phase angle shifts between two locations very precisely. And so the power company would like us to embed this in the device so we can understand what's happening in the power grid. But even more so, they would like better forecasts of renewables. And so this is work uh, with uh, one of the computer scientists at Argonne uh, to say something they refer to as now casting. When you run a model just several hours into the future, and then you use local data information about cloud cover, can I more accurately predict when that bank of photo uh, uh, voltaics is going to have a decrease because this cloud is going to move over it. And being able to predict that an hour before or 30 minutes before is actually a big deal for power companies that have to ramp up and down uh, large resources. And so their goal is to run this numerical forecast, right, linking the edge to the cloud. So run this numerical forecast, get local edge data about what's happening in the environment into the numerical forecast, and then make these uh, uh, um, predictions. Uh, we even have an example in uh, manufacturing that someone is doing at the laboratory. This is a process uh, called flame spray pyrolysis, where uh, you have this very cool looking jet uh, running this flame. And uh, when you burn the right kind of uh, uh, inputs, you get nanoparticles that are used for other experiments and for manufacturing out into this uh, tube uh, below. And right now, you can imagine uh, you can you could tune this to get the right sort of mix by measuring temperature, pressure, whatever. But those are really pretty uh, um, thin in terms of data, right? You're, you're, the, the rate in which you can make those adjustments is small. Looking visually at this and being able to run a computation right there at the edge to do the tuning and feedback is obviously the right way to go. And that's where these kinds of manufacturing processes would go. We also, of course, have those processes um, in big science, not just small science, uh, like that ice cube example I gave in Antarctica, we have the APS, which has very, very large uh, experiments where uh, the x-ray is being used to image something and then they have to process right there sort of in real time what's happening. So that's a, a, a large scale example. They wouldn't need small computing, but they have a rack of computing right there at the edge. So, uh, of course, we are not the first, uh, or maybe we're the first in our science area, but the, the commercial world is catching up with us. And, uh, um, and Amazon recently deployed something uh, uh, as an experimenter project called Deep Lens. And uh, this is the one that's in my office here, uh, Peak Hacking. And uh, you can download your own edge component into this device. So in this case, I've loaded up the face detection uh, computation and then if it detects a face or you can give it some count you know five faces in your room then you can issue a lambda function and you call it through a callback and you can have some computation run uh, which might do something now again it's supposed to be an edge solution where you're not streaming all the data but what this device has is a little Linux box and it has a camera and it has machine learning uh, components deployed out at the edge uh, of course, other companies are working on this as well, uh, and the simple one, you know, Ring, uh, or one of these video doorbells, it really only does, you know, is there motion in front of the doorbell, I'll start recording. But you can imagine the future where these become much more sophisticated parallel computation devices, and it will tell, you know, who you are, or uh, what kind of packet you're delivering, how big, all of that sort of thing. Um, of course, uh, Facebook has been working on something that was announced recently, um, I'm not sure this is an edge device. I think it actually sends all the data. Um, uh, uh, that's a Facebook policy. Um, 
but uh, the, rest the, rest the rest of these are trying to throw the data away. Um, okay, so uh, so we have this computing continuum, and again, you know, I started out. At, uh, we were joking this morning. You know, I, I my first part of my career, I even worked on functional programming languages and parallelism, right? Uh, and the idea of how to program something and what that looks like is actually a, quite a difficult problem. What the way we're coding these things right now is as individual computers hooked with IP addresses, right? There's no real architecture of computing across this. When you write a parallel code for a supercomputer, uh, you have an understanding of its parallel nature. You're writing in MPI or something higher level, Charm++, whatever it is, you're writing a code for a collective. We don't have that sort of collective code yet for the edge. We don't have a way to think about writing in that first picture I showed, writing code for the city of Chicago. Um, uh, but clearly, that's the future, is being able to write parallel apps for this, uh, uh, this edge. Now, the VC world has been diving into this space uh, aggressively. Right? So in early on, Google and others started creating server-side training accelerators, right? So the TPU, the things you heard about, right? Those are for accelerating training on the cloud side. But very quickly after that, there were companies that decided, you know, actually, maybe the important thing is inference at the edge. And so there are companies uh, like uh, NVIDIA who have started to build devices specifically for the edge. Uh, this is a company uh, called uh, Movidius and uh, Intel purchased them. Uh, they have a very, I, this is my Ovidius neural compute stick that I took apart so I could see what it looks like inside. Uh, and so it is a little USB connected test device uh, with a uh, 16 vector processor core here, right? Runs at a quarter watt. And uh, what is its use right now? It's in those DJI Spark drones so those drones have gesture recognition, so you can tell the drone, you know, take a selfie by making a gesture. And this chip sees that image, does that processing at the edge, determines what your gesture is and whether to back up or move forward. So there's an enormous investment in this edge soft hardware and software, as well as server side. So Cerebus is a server side. The thing from my perspective is as a science guy is that I want to look at how to apply this kind of tech to science domains. I'm not interested in the Facebook camera or the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the drone uh, you know, gesture detection. I want to put these things and understand how to do this with fire, uh, environmental monitoring, wildlife, and so forth. And now we get to the, you know, where is your imagination lead you with this kind of science? Uh, everyone we've talked to, every time we go to a city or we go to a science uh, domain and chat with someone, they come up with a different use that you just go, wow, yeah, that's exactly how the future will be, right? So I'll give you some examples. We talked to the folks in Portland, and they said, you know, we have these bike share bikes. Uh, uh, maybe they're not as dangerous as those Lime scooters I see uh, around <laughs> campus. Uh, but we have the question, if the city provides bike share bikes, how many people wear helmets? Do they actually wear fewer helmets if they ride the bike share than their own bike? So is the city contributing to, you know, uh, a danger, right? So of course this is a machine learning computer algorithm problem where I need to be able to determine what's a bike share bike. I need to determine whether someone has a helmet or just maybe big hair. Uh, that was, might be able to save you as well. Um, and so you could do these experiments where you understand what's happening in a city, again, not without violating people's privacy, but make, posing questions. We have urban uh, and regular wildlife questions, people wanting to understand bird song and just being able to say, I want to process bird song right there at the edge. I want to know where birds are migrating, what speed. We have uh, cameras that are deployed in urban environments where they're looking for coyotes and other wildlife and understanding what's happening. Uh, we talked to someone in Detroit and they had a very interesting question, which was they're, they're redoing all their traffic signals so that they have sort of dynamic management of traffic signals. 
And they posed the following question. They said, well, you know, if we could look at an intersection and determine if somebody with a mobility problem in a wheelchair or cane is not going to make it across the street in time, should we be turning the light green, <laughs> right? Well, no, you shouldn't, right? Uh, again, this is a science problem. We have to write a parallel computation that could run out on the edge that could determine maybe it's not safe to change the light at this point. Uh, steerable radars, even personal protective gear. You know, we talk to some people who do safety and they say, you know, you would love it if when you're in the laboratory, it would sort of remind you if it realized you did not have your safety glasses on or your hard hat or your steel toe boots or your vest or whatever it is. Um, so that it's just a, a simple reminder, hey, looks like, uh, um, please double check, you're not really ready for, to do this uh, uh, dangerous work or to do this safely. So we have a variety of examples. Uh, even over here, uh, this is a person you know, in Chicago falling uh, on the ice. Uh, but someone has said, you know, we would love to be able to calculate when cars are moving into intersections and they sort of move diagonally and cross the stop line. That indicates that the road is slippery there, right? And ice is accumulating. And we could then dynamically choose to send a salt truck right there then. Right? Again, this is a machine learning problem. You gotta deploy an algorithm out there. You have operating system problems with balancing resources. You have to deploy stuff out at the edge. So, uh, so wrapping up now, um, even looking up one higher, I sort of drew that continuum picture, but if we look even one up one level and we say, what I'd really like to do is be able to specify almost in natural language, something like this. I want to predict what the urban response is to rainfall and then have some intelligent reaction when that happens. And what that really would look like then is something like, okay, well, if there's some flood or we have to warn the residents, what does that look like with respect to the logic? Where do those bits of code run in this infrastructure from the prediction and the simulation that happens in your supercomputing to the edge inference that's happening to determine what the local conditions are? So it presents a lot of research challenges for computer scientists. Uh, we have foundations of machine learning, uh, this continuous improvement that can happen by edge to cloud, edge to cloud, uh, compressing models and moving them back and forth. Of course, correctness, accuracy, and the sensitivity of the data um, are very difficult uh, uh, problems. We have programming model problems, as I described. I'm an operating system system software guy, so we actually have a lot of great OS problems because we need to balance resources and prioritize them in real time. So a good example is that drone detection code. Uh, you need to maintain about 15 frames a second or you can't track a drone. So if you drop below that, maybe 10 frames, eight frames a second, then the time between frames means that the pattern, the movement, you can't reference what's a bird, what's a drone, you have to be able to follow them. So we have a resource management problem now in the operating system. How many of these projects can we run and how do we prioritize and manage them to keep a quality of service uh, in the right place? Now I'll wrap up with an advertisement. So if you're interested in edge computing, uh, we have a workshop and uh, we would love people, if you have no people here on campus that are possible to submit to that workshop your work, we would love to see what's happening in this space. Um, it's also in a fun location, it's in Brazil. Uh, so I think that's also a long flight for you. Uh, <laughs> it is a long flight. Yes, 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 everywhere's a long flight. So uh, uh, please take a look at that if you're interested in having an edge application. Uh, if you're interested in the machine learning bits at the edge. Um, we also have a lot of work in tuning the instrument, specifically with the air quality. This is uh, the units uh, mounted at a EPA site and doing, you know, comparing the two data. I don't, didn't have time today to talk about the examination of the air quality data and how these experimental sensors compare. Uh, but with that, I'll wrap it up and uh, have time for questions.